Um, tell me what dark optimism means to mm. you. Yeah, dark optimism is a, a, a widely misunderstood thing. I seem to get a lot of people coming up to me saying, are you feeling dark today or optimistic? And it's like, yeah, that's not, that's not quite what I mean. Um, I think it means being um, unashamedly positive about the kind of world we could create, but unashamedly realistic about how far we are from doing that right now. So not uh, sort of bright, shiny optimism, which I can find quite frustrating, because you're like, well, everything isn't fine, actually, you know? Um, a sort of uh, an ability to look at the more difficult aspects of, of, of where we are and what we're doing, um, whilst also retaining this sort of deep um, faith in, in human potential and, and also drawing on, you know, the deeper questions of, of why we're really here and, you know, does the, does the state of the world in any way um, challenge our, our purpose in being here or make that impossible and I don't think it does even if even if we are into a world of, of unstoppable runaway climate change for example there's still love to do there's still positive change to make in the world and I think um, dark optimism is, is is remembering that whilst not not denying how how much suffering and difficulty there is Thank you. Um, are you familiar, familiar with dark mountain mm, very much yeah. mm. can you tell me how you relate to that at all? Or? Yeah, well, I was quite involved with Dark Mountain from the outset. Um, I mean, obviously, they, they, they stole my darkness <laughs> in their name. Um, but that, that's from a, a Jeffers poem, The Dark Mountain, originally. And, um, uh, yeah, Paul Kingsnorth and Dougald Hine are good friends of mine. Um, and, in fact, Dark Mountain's been quite a, quite a significant part in, in my own journey. Uh, I went to the first uh, Dark Mountain... Uh, festival, I think was the phrase they used, uncivilization. Um, and I was there to talk about how the sort of emerging Dark Mountain themes um, interact with transition and how the two kind of relate to each other. Uh, and while I was there, I met uh, Mark Boyle, who's known as the Moneyless Man. Uh, and he was there talking about his book, uh, The Moneyless Man. Um, and we immediately clicked, um, sort of became best friends. And I've been working with him very closely over the last few years. Um, so Dark Mountain is both, I think, uh, you know, an incredibly important part of, of um, enabling us to ask the questions that we're often not allowed to ask. Um, you know, maybe it is all too late, and if it is, what does that mean? And, and you know, maybe this problem isn't solvable. And I think there's a there's a sort of um, a logical flaw at the heart of a lot of arguments that we make in the sort of broader. I don't know, the movement, whichever movement label you want to put on it, um, which is that we tend to look at things and say, well, that won't work, so we need this. So, you know, well, example um, might be people saying, well, renewable energy can't ramp up fast enough to solve our energy crisis, so we need nuclear, or um, the mainstream parties aren't going to give us what we need, so we need the Green Party, or so we need not to vote, or so we need whatever. And the thing about that is that the premises and the conclusion don't join up. You might just as well say, renewable energy can't ramp up fast enough to deal with our energy crisis, so we need sardines, you know, or, or the mainstream parties aren't doing anything, so we need sardines. You've not said anything about the alternative. You've just said, this doesn't work, so that. Um, and I think Dark Mountain kind of addresses that to an extent. It's like we're saying, oh, well, um, you know, the, the argument we hear again and again in environmentalism is, you know, do, should we be working for radical change, you know, fundamental shifts, or should we be just working within the existing paradigms? And people are saying, well, you know, we, we don't have time to wait for a revolution. Everything has to happen now, so we've got to work within the existing paradigms. And then other people saying, well, you know, if, if we don't have a radical fundamental revolution, then what's the point? Because we're just addressing symptoms and we're not addressing... And both of those arguments, I think, are completely valid. And yet you hear people arguing back and forth and back and forth about this and never finding resolution. And I think the reason is because they can't admit that they're actually both right. Actually, there isn't time for radical change and we need radical change. And so if you can never accept that actually maybe they're both right and we have to ask some really deeper questions about, wait a second, what does that mean? Then you just end up with people over here having a nice career saying this and people over here having a nice career saying that and never actually getting to the, the deeper truth. And for me, Dark Mountain is a, a venue where we can ask those kind of questions. Well, what if this doesn't work and this doesn't work and we don't actually know of an alternative? And can we actually sit with that? And can we actually sit with that together? And can we have a conversation about what that means? Um, and to me, that's, 
that's a really potent and fertile um, space. <laughs> I do that sometimes. It's kind of fun in its way. <laughs> Stop in focus. <laughs> it is. Um, so, you know, I think what that says to me is that there's a place for sorrow and optimism mm. that I don't often see in, in a lot of the talk about how lovely things mm. will be and should be. Um, so do, do you agree? I mean, is that sorrow something you carry? And can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, part of part of my uh, my journey over the last few years is that um, David Fleming, who was my sort of uh, mentor and very close friend, passed away very suddenly at the end of 2010. Um, and actually, we were just a few weeks away from, from launching a big thing that we'd co-authored. Um, so it was a very difficult and busy time to try and hold that, deal with the work that he was going to be doing on that as well, and you know bring it through to the fruition we were both hoping for, whilst also trying to process the grief of, of the sudden loss of my my good friend and then actually just uh, three weeks after he passed my my fiance passed away very suddenly as well um, and so that was a profoundly challenging time um, and I'm quite happy with how I how I moved through that and I got those things done and then kind of came to a point of, of having the space to um, grieve a little more uh, and that's, I don't think grief is a process that ends. I think it's a, a relationship that, that, that continues throughout your life. Um, but I sort of found over the past few years that when I've been reflecting on and, and writing about my personal grief, um, there's a very strong correlation between that and the grief that many of us carry, maybe all of us carry, for the, the state of the world and, and the state of nature and the state of our society. And, and I think grieving, as opposed to loss, is a process of opening ourselves, that when, when we suffer uh, a loss that's overwhelming, we shut down because we're overwhelmed in the same way that you don't feel all the pain of a, of a mortal injury, your body just says that's too much pain, I'm going to shut it down. We shut that down and we shut down part of ourselves and that keeps us from being completely overwhelmed but it also keeps us from being fully alive. And the process of grieving is the process of, of coming back to life. And I think that our, on a personal level that's, that's very true, but I think on a societal level, on a collective level that's true as well. And I think that part of the reason that we fail collectively currently to face up to the kind of damage that we're doing in the world is because the grief of it is so overwhelming that the process of opening those doors again is incredibly difficult because every one of those doors was slammed shut because behind it was a huge overwhelming bunch of pain. So every time that you open one of them again, there it is waiting for you and you have to have the space to do that. Um, to, to, to work through that pain. Um, and it's only by doing that that you come back to life and you start to be able to respond to these problems in a way that is more sort of open and allows you to look at it all in the round and say, okay, what is the most appropriate way of acting here? Rather than the sort of, oh God, I can't look at that. I can't look at that. So I'm just going to get on with this. I'm going to keep my head down and work really hard at this thing because I can't look at the bigger questions because, because the grief is still there. Um, and so I think increasingly, uh, the you know as a as a sort of writer, I find I'm sort of writing all the time about whatever's going on in me, and the the writing that I've been doing more recently that seems to have touched the most people, um, and in a way that feels most powerful, has been around this 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 relationship between grief and despair, and and creating a space where we can um, open that out. And obviously, there are other amazing people doing that work as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like. Grief is a process, and despair mm. is sort of a dead end, you know? It's well, there's a, there's a really interesting thing about despair, I think, which is that it has a spark in it of deep motivation. I think despair can be described as looking at every possible scenario and seeing no hopeful one. But what that means is that if you can present to someone in despair one scenario that looks hopeful, that looks like a real possibility, there's this immense wealth of motivation to drive towards it because despair is not a nice place to be. 
So if you can actually present someone with something that's a possibility, even if it's just a narrow possibility, then despair becomes this huge drive, this huge motivation that can achieve incredible things. Let's lighten up a little bit. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Let's stop despairing. Right? <laughs> um, no, that was really lovely. Thank you. I did jot down a few questions in bed on my phone. Oh, they're the best ones. <laughs> Um, let's just go really large. Why did you come? <laughs> it's been done. Uh, to some extent, to, to listen more than to offer. Um, I mean, I'm, I, is, I've been invited here many times over the years and I've always, for one reason or another, not made it, often due to being quite busy. Uh, and to some extent, I think I came because a number of the things I've been working on have sort of fallen through lately. Um, and so, you know, I've come uh, bringing the gift of those, those failures which have opened up space um, in my life. And, you know, I'm sort of quite actively looking at the moment for the, the people, projects and places that maybe are going to form the core of the next chapter in my, my story. Um, and this seemed like a really, a really beautiful place to do that. Um, and, uh, and also, I guess, the, the theme of the New Story Summit, I mean, that really is the the overarching theme that's run through all my work. I mean, my, um, my book, The Transition Timeline, was very much about trying to create this, this transition vision um, and a sort of fourth, fourth story of, of how the future can pan out. And I think there are probably still three really dominant stories in our, in our culture about, about the future. And I think one is sort of business as usual, that you know, everything will basically carry on as it is and little things change, but nothing really fundamentally changes. And, you know, if the graph of whatever you're looking at looked like that for the last 30 years, it'll look like that for the next 30 years. And that's how so much government and business planning is done. And it's a really powerful story. And another one is doom, you know, of one flavor or another, whether it's Terminator or whether it's Age of Stupid or, or you know, in some way we're going to get our, get our comeuppance or religious apocalypse or whatever it might be. And again, we see that throughout our, our culture, in our stories, in our films, in our plays. And the other would be a sort of um, techno-utopia. Um, you know, your Star Trek, like the, our manifest destiny is to be off exploring the stars and we're this incredible, ingenious species that's just this sort of uh, the myth of progress, as I like to call it, that we're just continuing on along this path towards our glorious future. And I think all three of those are in all of us because they're in our culture and they're fundamental to our culture and probably we all draw on all three of those at different times in different contexts in our lives. Um, and it's really easy to see why the, uh, the sort of techno-utopia future is, is the most compelling of those, it's the most positive of those. Um, and I think that's why an awful lot of the people who are trying to uh, work for change in society are, are trying to work towards that because it's the compelling narrative. I'd much rather live in a future that's beautiful techno-utopia than one that's, that's business as usual or one that's doom. Um, but I think one of the things that, that Transition and our wider movement does is try and flesh out, firstly, the problem with that techno-utopia vision, which is that it's actually not realistic, that there are all sorts of things that tell us that that, that sort of agenda is, is, is running up against the buffers and running into all kinds of intrinsic problems. Um, and so what we need is a, is a realistic, positive story to set alongside that. Um, and I think in all the diverse manifestations of all the people who are here for the next week, um, that's, what, that's what this is about and that's really what, what all of my work's been about. So yeah, it felt like a very fertile place to be at this point in my life.